to NPS Now, your source for news and information about Norfolk Public Schools. I'm your host, Karen Tanner, and today we have a special show. We're going to be talking about back to school and how parents can get ready and be prepared for the new school year. And with me today is Helen Phillips, the Senior Director of School Nutrition. Welcome, Helen, to NPS Now. Thank you, Karen. It's good to be here. And you are like a regular on the show every year. We bring you back, especially during this time of the year, to talk about what's happening in school nutrition. So tell me something. Is, is back to school time? I know school nutrition workers are getting ready. How do they prepare for back to school? It is a big job for us to get ready to come back to school. Um, all summer we've been working on our food and supply specs and getting all of our new items in. Our warehouse guys are busy every day getting case upon case of new food and supplies into our warehouse ready to go. The um, foods and supplies will start shipping to the schools the week before school and then we'll be ready to open our doors for the kids. <laughs> but meanwhile our summer on top of all those preparations we've also been feeding a lot of our students over the summer in our summer meals programs. So some of our staff has never stopped working. We just keep rolling all summer long right into the school year. How many meals do you think you've served over the summer? Over the summer, we do about 7,000 breakfasts a day and about 8,000 lunches each day in the summertime. So, uh huh. That's about a third of our normal school day during the school year. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. And it sounds like you were great. It was a great success. It was. Yes. Is this our the first year we did this? No, this is our fourth year being sponsors of the summer program, and we've grown every year. So we're excited to be able to reach so many children in our community throughout the summer months, too. So, what's a typical day like for a cafeteria worker coming in the door and then when they leave out? All right, so coming in um, in the morning, first things, usually we're the first people to arrive, kind of us and maybe a custodian, and we get into the buildings and we start prepping that breakfast. We've got some really nice breakfast programs throughout the city, so we begin with prepping breakfast, and even before we serve breakfast, we're already starting our lunch preparations for the day. Um, throughout the day, in all of the schools, we serve about 14,000 breakfast each day and about 24,000 lunches each day, and then it's cleanup time after that, and. <laughs> get all the paperwork done, which some of them, that's their least favorite part of the job because we tend to be people people and we like to um, get out there and talk to the kids and see the, the teachers and the kids every day. But the day ends with the paperwork part of the day and the cleanup. How many school nutrition workers do we have? That's a lot of work for somebody. It is a lot of work and we have about 350 people who work for us throughout the school year. That's a lot. Yeah. That is a lot. So we told the kids, thank your cafeteria worker when you're <laughs> yeah. in there. Yes. Great. So what are some things that parents need to know for back to school? We are really excited about approval we just got from the state that we will have 23 schools participating in the community eligibility provision this year. And what that means is in those 23 schools, all meals for all students are served free. Hmm. So that's very exciting. So the students in those schools can come and have free breakfast and free lunch every single day. And that's nearly half of our schools. So we're really excited to be able to offer that. It's grown now. We had eight schools participate last year, and so we're up to the 23 this year. That is exciting. Yes. So how did our schools get picked for this? The determination, the application is based on the percentage of free and reduced el eligible but mostly it comes down to the ones that are directly certified and that's um, mm -hmm. where we match up with social services. The students who really don't need to um, complete a meal application but they're matched up with the social service database. So how can parents sign their children up for the school lunch program? Right, the meal application is on our website for the new 15, 15 16 school year mm -hmm. and then it will be mailed out to parents hopefully by the end of this week and then they can return the application to their school nutrition manager at school or they can drop it into the mail to us either way but the students at those 23 schools do not need to complete a meal application so that's a really great benefit to the families of those 23 schools is no meal applications at all so a letter will go home to those children or the parents of those children at those uh, 22 schools yes we hope also by the end of this week um, before the applications go out to be able to send a letter to the families that do not even need to complete an application because they are in the community eligible schools now tell me do you have a long website because I'd love to tell the parents how to get this information we are the, um, the same website as NPS and then slash nutrition. Slash nutrition. Yeah. So www.mpsk12 slash nutrition. Yes. Okay, that's quick and easy. Quick and easy. <laughs> <laughs> so is there an online program? So I know I use the meal pay. So explain that program for some parents who aren't aware of that. 
Yes, another great benefit to our students and parents is our Meal Pay Plus program where you can go online and put money on your student's account and you can use that money or the student can use that money for meals or for snack purchases. Mm -hmm. And another great thing about here in Norfolk is because when the students come through the line we itemize what they get for each meal that the parent can then go online and see exactly what their child had to eat today. So that's a good, another good benefit. And the software is set up where you can have um, reminders sent to you so that the balance never gets below a certain level, whatever you set it at, and it can do automatic um, repayments to or reloading the, the account for you. That's great, and, and we, we want to squash any misperceptions that if your child, if you forget to go on meal pay, that your child will eat. Oh, absolutely. It's like you want, the child will not, <laughs> not be fed. Yes. They will eat, and they will just have an alternative meal, or will it be whatever it's being served that day? We still take cash on the serving lines, so if you don't do the Meal Pay Plus program, we do take cash on the serving lines. Mm -hmm. And if your child loses money or forgets money for a day, we do allow some student charges as well, up to three meals a day, or three meals can be charged at one time. Oh, great. And you talked earlier about the uh, dinner program and the other programs. How does that dinner program really work? Like this past summer, you talked about that, but during the school year, how does that dinner program work? Yes, our dinner program has really grown too. Some of our after-school snack programs have converted into dinner programs, and we currently have it in about 20 schools. And it's a wonderful program where the students um, who are staying after school for any type of event at all, any type of meeting, any type of sports practice, whatever reason keeps them in that building after school hours, they can then stay and enjoy a dinner meal with us as well. And these have been really successful, I think, because it's a smaller environment. So it's a little bit more um, friendly and social than lunchtime can be sometimes with large crowds. Mm -hmm. And we've um, really enjoyed getting to know the kids because even our staff gets to know the kids a little bit better when they come in those small groups at dinner time. So it's been a, a great benefit, I think, to the children and to us as well. So whatever you serve for lunch, that's not what you're having for dinner. It's something totally different. Correct. Well, it's the same types of foods, but we don't mm -hmm. serve the same thing at dinner time that we served at lunch time. Um, we've made that mistake sometimes by accident, but it's not <laughs> our intention to serve the same food breakfast and well, dinner. Well, if it was something that they lunch liked, then they would have been happy yes. to have it twice in one day. <laughs> Why is it so important, Helen, for us to provide these nutritious options for our students? Oh, we all know that good nutrition is at the core of good health. Um, no matter who we are, whatever stage of life we're in, um, our good health really starts with what we put into our bodies. So it's important for us to, in the school nutrition program, to kind of role model good food for kids. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really what our role is, is to put out good nutritious food so that everything that we provide is a healthy choice for our students and hope that when they graduate, they'll take some of these good habits with them. To their family. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what are some other good uh, items you have coming up in school nutrition? Well, we're excited this year. We're going to, in our high schools, continue our made-to-order salad bar and made-to-order deli lime. This seems to be what the high school students especially like. It's you know, made for me right in front of me as I come through the serving line. Later this year, we have some plans to maybe expand that. That might be another show, another opportunity for me to come back and talk Good. to you about that. We're also going to continue our limited time offers, and that's where we offer one special item um, on a certain day of the week at elementary, middle, and high school, so all levels get to enjoy that, but it's something special we bring in for just a short time and try to create some excitement around that item. And you used to have taste testings at we your still, schools. Yes, we still do taste testings with our kids. We like to provide our children what they really want to eat, and so when we um, are testing new recipes, we'll take that right out to the kids and let them taste test. And sometimes it's not a new recipe, but maybe testing known products, but different manufacturers to see mm. which flavor profile by the manufacturer our students prefer. And then they make, they make the big bucks decisions, so then we will <laughs> tend to go with the company that our students have picked themselves. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the show today, Helen, and getting us ready for back to school, and hopefully they'll go to the website to get the information about uh, signing up for school lunch programs. Thank you, Karen, it's good to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Helen, I appreciate you. And we want you to stay tuned for more MPS Now.
with me today is Andrea Sakura, Senior Director for Information Technologies, who's going to share all the great technology opportunities for our students and our parents this school year. Welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you, Karen. It's nice to be here. Great. We had you on the show in October to talk about Parent View. So kind of give us a refresher of what Parent View is and how that works. Sure. Parent View is our web portal for parents to be able to access their students' data, basically. Um, they can see the grades, grade book, uh, they can see class schedules, um, contact teachers, um, anything dealing with their students. This year, um, what's going to be nice is last year they kind of had the ability to view that information. Um, this year we're giving them the ability to set notifications. So if they want to know if they've gotten a new grade for their student or if there's been a discipline infraction or maybe there's been an absence, these, um, this information can be emailed to them based on the notifications that they set for themselves within the product. Keep in mind too that Parent View also gives the parents the ability to view all of their students from one space. So instead of having to log in and log out and see each of their students individually, regardless of what school they're in within NAFA, they can see it all from one place. So are there any other new features that are coming that weren't there last year? That's going to be what we're mostly bringing to them this year is the ability for them to be able to set notifications for themselves so they don't have to log in daily and those types of things. They can look for an email notification. The one thing that is very important to mention is that the parental information is up to date. Um, what we noticed last year was that if our parent information wasn't up to date, they may be getting uh, a phone call or an email, but they're not receiving it. So make sure that the parents are calling their schools, visiting their schools, making sure they have the most uh, up-to-date information in their parent record. What kind of response did we have for parents with this new program? Um, it was it was mixed. Um, overall, anyone who was using the system felt like they really liked it. They thought it was a better system as far as being able to view everything. As with any new system, the switchover can be difficult for parents. We were coming off of um, a product that had been in the district for many years and going to a new student information system, making that switch over for all parents is difficult. So we are still pushing forward with getting parents involved and making sure that they're using this product um, so that it helps with the engagement that they have. They also have the ability to contact the teachers. So, mm -hmm. I mean, how wonderful is that? You're in there, you're looking at this student assignment or grade, you have a question, you can click on the teacher's name, you can email them directly and have that you have communication. communication with Absolutely. Them. When will this be available for parents? In the fall? or It will be available first day of school. First day of school. That's great. So we're also branching out with Student View. Yes. Share that information with us. Student View is almost identical as far as a web portal for the students to be able to view all of their classes, their grades, their grade book, um, <coughs> discipline, absences, and all that as well. Uh, we did not release that last year. Um, we, we really wanted parents and students to be doing that together as an engagement piece. Mm -hmm. This year, uh, it will be available for students. Um, it's not going to be a different logon for them. It's going to be the same student login that they've been using um, within their school. So uh, we're very excited about bringing that to them. So kind of explain to some students that may be watching the show. Sure. What does Student View mean to them? What Student View means to them is it gives them the ability to stay on top of their grades, um, their class schedules, um, their, it, as long as their uh, <coughs> teachers are updating all of that information for them in, the, in their calendar, they'll be able to see their assignments. Again, be able to contact their teachers directly through email and have that contact and, and just really stay engaged with what it is that they're doing throughout the year and where their grades are and keep an eye on it. So what's the difference between Student View and Parent View? How do the two programs differ? The difference is with Parent View, again, if you have multiple kids within the mm -hmm. system, you can see all of that. From, from a Student View perspective, Karen Tanner logs in. Karen Tanner sees all of her information specifically for her, for her classes, um, her absences, her discipline. She cannot see her siblings' information. So it is a very specific, personalized portal for her learning. And when will we have this available for our First students? First day of school. First day of school. We're ready to go. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm telling my sibling, my children to check on Absolutely. theirs. Absolutely. 
Yeah, so we've also begun a new program called Blackboard. That's the way that we can call home to our parents. Correct. With the different options that we never had before, text messaging, email. Yep. Kind of explain how is that going to work for us this year. Blackboard is um, our replacement product to Edulink. It is a newer, faster product. Um, again, mass communication. Um, the point being that um, this has got some um, some features that we didn't have with our older product. And so, like you mentioned, um, parents are going to have the ability to receive messages via phone, text message, email. Again, it's very important that parents have the most up-to-date information at their student's school so that that information gets translated so when there is a communication that goes out. It gives us a little bit more flexibility than what we had with Edulink. Um, as far as being able to break down into subgroups, uh, obviously we can email an entire school, we can email the entire district. Uh, Mrs. Smith can email her sixth grade class that they're going to be doing something specific on Friday mm -hmm. um, or phone the message in or text it. Um, it gives a lot more flexibility for our administration as well. They have um, a mobile app that they can upload messages to and be able to send it on the fly. Um, it also has social integration. So, you know, the social media piece is huge these days. So I think the, the more ways we can get the message out to mm -hmm. our parents, staff, and students, uh, the quicker they can make informed decisions. Can parents opt in or opt out? Yes, of course they can. They always have the ability. Mm -hmm. If they do not want to receive messages, they can call down here and we can make sure that they're taken out of the system. Um, but again, from an engagement standpoint, I think the more information you have, the better you are off. So what's the overall goal, you think, with these technologies for the parents and the students? Engagement. Uh, we really would like to make sure that parents have all the information they need to be able to make informed decisions, which leads to a higher level of engagement for them and their students within the district. Um, that's the only way we are going to be able to move forward with um, sustaining the goals, and meeting the goals. Um, so I think that you know the, the, the better we can do at providing that information, um, the better it's going to be for our community. And our society has shifted to social media, Absolutely. so everyone's using social media and other technologies, their phones, so this is a great way, even as a parent for me, I think it's great to be able to get text messages. Right, you're, you're out to dinner, you are in the midst of running errands, and your phone is receiving it, whether it be you know, email, a phone call, or text but you're getting that you don't have to go home to find out that there's something going on at the school. Oh, quick question for you because sure. some folks have data plans. Yes. How will this work for parents who have text messaging that may not have unlimited texting or how does that whole process work? Well, it's up to them. They do not have to receive text messages. That's an opt-in type of thing. They can decide whether they want to receive that via text or they want to receive it via email or phone and then that way it does not affect them. Great. Thank you, Andrea. Great information. You're very welcome. <laughs> we'll have you back on the show again to talk more. Great. Thank you. Great. Stay tuned for more NPS Now. Welcome back to NPS Now. I'm Steve Sutton, the Senior Coordinator of Athletics. Today we're going to kick off with football and we have Andy Hilton from Recruit757.com. Andy, you were here last year. You had a lot of good information. We want to welcome you back. Thank you. It's good to be back. All Thank right. you for having me on. Okay. Well, like I said, it's football season and that's the number one sport that kicks us off at the high school level. So let's talk a little bit about football. And, um, but first, before we do that, let's talk a little bit about Recruit 757. What do you do for us? I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. I work with schools, parents, coaches, athletes from all over the region, really elevating the profile of football athletes in the region. We're now into basketball as well, so there's an opportunity okay. to talk a little bit about that. But there are a lot of scholarships that go into foot, college football, and one of the things we help the community with is how to prepare to earn those scholarships and putting players into position for earning those scholarship offers. It'll pay, pay things forward for them. Okay, so tell us, what, how does a parent and a child get to your website, get involved with it? Well, certainly the website is recruit757.com and we list as many players as we can that will be college eligible athletes moving forward. So we look to identify varsity athletes that are in good academic standing and 
with a, those that have a plan to play college mm -hmm. football. So there's educational opportunities for the parents to learn about the recruiting process, and parents can also log on to the website, subscribe if they want to manage their player's profile, which helps them with their player reaching out to the college coaches that recruit in the region okay. and offer scholarships. All right. Well, let's talk about football. Let's talk about the Eastern District. And let's start off with Granby High School, who's in Conference One, who's a 6A school. So uh, go ahead, talk well, about Granby. And Granby had a tough year last year. You've got Sekou Wilson as the head coach, who now has his feet under him. But realistically, the uh, cupboard is still filling at Granby. Keyshawn Brown will be one of the key players. He's playing quarterback for the Comets. Mm -hmm. They had a 1-9 and nine season last year. They're going to look for opportunities to gather more wins. 6A is tough. Quite often it takes six or seven wins to make the playoffs, so they'll need to make a big leap forward this year if they're going to be playoff bound. Okay. So um, last year you, you mentioned they were one and nine. What are some of the things that they need to do to, to get over that, uh, to get in, to get more wins? Sure. Well, certainly depth is an issue. The schedule gives them some opportunities. With an Eastern District schedule, you have three out-of-conference games. However, there are some challenges on their schedule, and of course, in district they have teams like Lake Taylor and Norview that they're going to have to pull out some wins where they're going to be the underdog if they have to uh, if they get five or six wins they'll give themselves a shot all right so so with their schedule if we take a look at that um, where do you see them maybe getting that first win well they start off with Warwick okay. Warwick had a similar problem in the peninsula last year not gathering very many wins. Warwick is progressing just like Granby is. They need to open their season with a win against Warwick. Kickatan's going to be a tough contender, and then you jump right into the district schedule with uh, games against Wilson and Booker T. Mm -hmm. That goes right where Granby has to be a better team than last year and has to pull out some games they couldn't pull out last year. All right. As always, I put you on the hot seat. How many wins do you think they're going to get this year? I think Granby may make a slight step forward. They finished the season against Maury. If they pull out that game, there's a chance of two or three wins, but I don't see Granby as a playoff team this okay. year. All right. Let's move on to 5A, and um, our first school is going to be Maury High School. Let's talk about Maury and uh, what we have, uh, what players are, are they looking for? Well, Maury is in a similar situation as Granby. They had one win last year. They lost to Granby in the finale. They certainly have to pull that out, but there's a whole lot of games to be played before that season finale against Granby comes along. They're going to rely on quarterback Kevin Mills. They have some interesting players, including a couple of converted basketball players, one at wide receiver, one at tight end. Uh, these are guys that are uh, mid-level basketball players but could really be difference makers on the field, okay. uh, on the football field. For Maury. All right, so with Maury, um, what, what do they have to do to get over you know, what they've done last year? How can they get more wins? Well, and Maury's just two seasons away from playoff. They had a playoff win against Kellum two years ago. They can do it. They have the athletes. The thing is going to be, can they execute? And Chris Frazier is a great coach for Maury. The talent's there. Is the execution going to be there? And then you get into their schedule, and just like Granby, they're going to have to find winnable games. Mm -hmm. Well, with, with Mari, and, and I've talked to Coach Frazier a little bit, he's excited about that uh, skill position athlete that he has. So talk a little bit about uh, their running back, Devion Little. Well, he, D has been with the program for several years now. Uh, he's back again. He's a speed guy. He's elusive. He can return kicks and punts. He does great things in the secondary, as well as playing running back. So realistically, D. Little could make or break the season for Maury. They want to get the ball in his hands, and they want to put him in a position to make plays. All right, well, let's, let's look at their schedule, and, and, um, and get, let's go through that. I see Norcom could be tough. Traditionally, it's a tough game for them. But Norcom is a lot younger this year and could be down a little bit this year. Grassfield is tough. Norview is tough. Churchland is on the rise. So really, if Maury is going to win more games than last year, they're going to have to start strong early. And with the new playoff system, um, a, a five and five record can, could get them in. Especially in 5A, because in the last couple of years, we've seen at 5A, Princess Anne right. and Kempsville get in with two wins. Now, that gives you a first round matchup against a very strong number one seed, but still, two wins has gotten you in in yeah. 5A. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's the way the playoffs were designed to be, but unfortunately because of the team uh, structure, the structure of the programs are in that class, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't take as many wins to get into 5A as it would for 6A. Okay. All right, let's move on to Norview High School, who's had two playoff years in a row now. Coach Cotton um, has established a program. 
So let's talk about Norview. Well, Norview, along with Lake Taylor, really in terms of Norfolk Public Schools, mm -hmm. they are the class of the city. Norview is strong, Lake Taylor is strong. Norview has been able to uh, really uh, rise to the top under Coach Delton Cotton. He's done amazing things for that program in just a couple of years. The big question mark for them, they have DJ Mack, Dariel Mack at quarterback, right. who was playing wide receiver last year as a sophomore. Now, in his junior season, this is his team. But he has a lot of talent around him, and that uh, he seems to be ready for the occasion. We've seen him a lot this summer, and Norview looks very strong coming into the season. All right, like we said, Coach Cotton's been there for two years. What's he done to, to just to elevate that program to the status where it is right now? Well, the big problem with Norview was they had, and I can't remember the number exactly, I want to say six coaches in five seasons. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of turnover at the position. Greg Gibson did great things with them, but was only there for a year, left for Western Branch. Right. So when Coach Cotton came in, there really was a need for continuity. And the players there needed a coach they could believe in. They needed to believe a coach was going to stick around and uh, help them become a program, not just a team. Okay. So with their schedule? You certainly see eight or nine wins, which is more than enough to get into the playoffs. And they really will have proven that they've arrived if they can top Lake Taylor and pull off a perfect, perfect season. Okay. All right, well, you said Lake Taylor. Let's move to Lake Taylor, our only 4A school now in the city. Uh, and our defending uh, state champion at 15-0. and 0. Uh, Let's talk about Lake Taylor and all the talent that they have. And you would think with Lake Taylor having a state championship season and losing talent due to graduation, you've got players like Nyree Quinterly who's gone on to play at East Carolina. You have guys coming up like Darnell Yule, who's a junior lineman who'll be, who is bigger and better than ever. You have three great senior leaders in Wayne Davis, Kevon Bruton and Mike Carney who will be different makers, difference makers for the, uh, for the Titans. It doesn't look like they're going to miss a beat. 15-0 and 0 is a strong possibility again for them, but the schedule, Bobby Pannenbacker loves to schedule tough, and this year's no different. They've scheduled a very tough bunch of opponents. Okay, so, you know, they had that senior leadership last year. They were able to, to run the table. What is going to be their biggest opponent this year? Not, well, not team-wise, not mm -hmm. who they're playing, but what do they have their, to their biggest challenge. Their biggest challenge. The nice thing is Hank Sawyer has a system in place and the kids know what's coming. It's a very disciplined team. They run a twin veer offense. They run a defense that is in attack mode every play of the game. So things really haven't changed at Lake Taylor. So as long as the players who've been in the system already pick up on the consistency, the continuity, the style of coaching, there really shouldn't be too many big challenges. Injuries were a challenge two years ago. If you remember right. that they had a state championship season, played Oscar Smith in the opener, lost their quarterback, lost their second string quarterback, that bit them mm -hmm. that year. That's They could really have had three state championships in and, a row. And that, that would, might be the part answer. Of football, and that's, uh, that's, that's for every team, uh, sure. is that injury bug. But you know they're so deep uh, in, in talent and in positions that Sometimes, you know, their injuries, they can overcome, where some other teams, they just can't overcome the injury. Absolutely. So, so looking at their schedule, um, yeah, obviously you think they can go uh, run the table again, but highlight some of the teams that they're playing. Well, one of the interesting non-district games comes right off the bat in the season opener at Heritage. You're talking about two 4A powerhouses facing off against each other to open the season. This could be a pre prequel to the playoffs. They could see Heritage come playoff time. Then you look at uh, a Monticello team that is, or Monticello team, depending on those of us from Norfolk who want to pronounce yeah. it Monticello. Uh, they're a strong program. You have Northeastern down in North Carolina, Elizabeth City area, who was strong last year. But from what I know, they've lost a lot of senior leadership. They may not be as strong. So that gives Lake Taylor an opportunity, one, two, three, to win their out of district games and they hop into the district as we mentioned with Norview. Norview is going to be the biggest challenge in their district schedule. Right. So with, with, this, with this schedule, can they get back to the state finals and can they go back to back? I'm a believer. Absolutely, I think they can. Okay, well that sounds good for us. So, <laughs> all right, um, let's move on to our last team and it's a 3A school. This is the first time that um, uh, with the restructuring of the Virginia High School League, um, Booker T has fallen into the class of 3A. So let's talk a little bit about Booker T. They have a new football coach, DJ Alexander. 
Uh, we're excited about that. He's done some nice things mm -hmm. uh, up until now, um, but the season's going to get going, so we're going to see what DJ's made out of. So talk about Booker T. Yeah, this is DJ's first crack at being a head coach. He was an assistant at Hickory uh, under Jupiter Wilson there. The one thing that's really interesting about Booker T, when you compare them to the other Norfolk schools, Lake Taylor's a powerhouse, Norview's a powerhouse, Granby and Maury are really looking to build. Booker T sits in that middle ground. Mm -hmm. They made the playoffs last year. They won their first playoff game, which is a bit of a surprise. They were an underdog. New head coach, the Gaddy twins. One's a lineman, one's a quarterback. Both have left the school. Jamari Logan is a lineman who uh, is he's gathering. A he's a big lineman, big boy at about six foot five and 300 plus pounds. He's the one that uh, opposing uh, defensive coordinators are going to key on to try to uh, run away from him, mm -hmm. uh, or excuse me, offensive coordinators are going to try to run, run away from him. Otherwise, the story at Booker T is just that pool of talent that they continue to draw from, ultra athletic players. And it's a big question mark as okay. far as coming into the season. We don't know exactly what Booker T could do. They could repeat and be a middle of the pack playoff team next year. I think it would be a shock if they won a ton of games, but it would also be a surprise if they uh, couldn't manage to win enough games to make the playoffs at 3A. Okay. Well, I, I, let's look at that schedule. Let's see if we can get uh, get them into the playoffs. Yes. So what and about that's Booker T schedule. And that's the big question: is what Booker T team is going to show up. Mm -hmm. We know they're athletic. We would expect them to be well coached with, with DJ Alexander leading the way, but we haven't seen him as a head coach yet. Denby is a lower level Peninsula team this year. Denby is a winnable game. John Marshall has always had some struggles. Inner city Richmond schools typically struggle in football, whereas we've mentioned before in basketball, those are some great teams. Holmes is a question mark. Granby should, could, could and should be right. a win. But uh, again, we'll have to go back to leaving it unanswered as to what the expectations are for Booker T because it really does depend on what Booker mm -hmm. T team shows up. Okay, so <clears throat> out of the Eastern District, what, do you, what teams do you think will make the playoffs? Yeah, you what have can we look to, forward to? You have to count on Norview and Lake Taylor coming close to running the table and being higher seeds. Booker T is the one that the jury's still out on, but Certainly, it seems like things are lining up that mm -hmm. if they do what they need to do, they can get enough wins to make the playoffs, and they're going to be a far different team come November than they are right now. Maury, Granby should struggle. Granby being in 6A, it's going to be tough to make the playoffs because it takes so many wins. Maury, if they can pull some upsets and uh, win a few extra games, heck, even two games, but let's hope for three or four, mm -hmm. maybe five, Maury could be a playoff team this okay. year. All right, well... <clears throat> I work for Norfolk Public Schools, so I'm going to say all five are going to make it. They've all worked hard uh, to get where they are today, and uh, we're looking for great things from all our teams. So, Andy, a lot of information, a lot of good information. We appreciate you being here again. Um, so we're going to look forward to seeing you out uh, on the field. And we'll be out there in full force. Thank you again for having me. Thank you. More NPS Now after this. now we're talking about back to school and Bob Kleinbell who's the transportation director senior director of transportation is here with us to talk about how parents can get ready and be prepared for back to school so welcome to MPS now well thank you for having me this morning I think you're what we've had two other people here but I think you may be the most important one because you transport our children to school every day so tell me how do you prepare for the first day of school well, of course, that process started a long time ago. You know, as we, uh, we get the information as far as the students, uh, what school they will be attending. Uh, and then, uh, of course, that's fed to our information, uh, student information system. And then, uh, then we look at uh, routing. You know, if, if the student is going to be riding a school bus, of course, and the parents would want to know what uh, bus stop that the child should be at, the time, of course. And so we, we look at all that to find out which students are eligible for transportation. And we actually uh, go through a routing system uh, to, uh, to identify, you know, what would be the best stop for those students. So we've been in the process now for about a month or so now putting that all together. So we're, we're, still, we're still working on them. We're still finalizing some of the, uh, the bus routes that, uh, that will, and again, that process will continue this week. 
And that's important because, you know, you still have parents registering their children right up to the first day of school. When is the deadline you think you all need for parents to have their children registered by? I'm not sure exactly when that deadline will be, but uh, our goal is to have the bus routes out to the public next week. Excellent. So they'll be available on the uh, MPS website as well as each school will receive a copy of their bus routes. So there'll be two locations that parents can you know, look for that information, the website and as well at the, uh, the school the child will be attending. And so they can go to www.mpsk12 slash transportation. No, just the uh, the uh, regular website, and if they look under the parent the oh, link on the there, parent portal. on the parent portal, if they look under there, there'll be a you know a location for a, a bus stop location. Uh, there'll be a, a a way to access that information, and if they follow the instructions that uh, are in that portal, uh, they can look up their uh, students' information, the bus stop information. Now, the only thing I would caution is for those students who attend one of the citywide uh, program, the one of the schools, Our the academies, right. uh, they need to look at the advanced search feature and follow the instructions uh, for identifying uh, where that bus stop will be. So next week, information should be coming into the mail to all of the children in the households discussing transportation and bus schedules. Yes, and again, it'll be available on the website as well as each school will have a copy of their bus routes. So what do you, do you make a suggestion to parents that, you know, it's the first week of school, give us, what, five, ten minutes before you call to see if you're late? Well, we recommend that the children be at the bus stop five minutes prior to the arrival of the school mm -hmm. bus. Now, realize, you know, the first day of school that uh, uh, things don't always go as smooth as we would always like to be. So, you know, allow us some time, uh, a few minutes there, uh, you know, even though the, uh, again, we, we asked that the students be at the bus stop five minutes prior to the arrival of the school bus. So say something happens and it's 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes, who do they contact? Okay. Well, best thing to do in a case like that is to uh, uh, check with uh, our dispatch office. Now, granted that the first few days of school is going to be rather difficult to get through because, you know, we are taking a lot of phone calls at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, again, I would, you know, give it uh, some time to see if uh, the bus has not been delayed. Uh, and again, you know, depending upon traffic patterns here in, in our area, uh, you know, it, it's kind of hard to judge sometimes. So we try to be on schedule, but uh, we're at the mercy of the traffic in many cases as right. well. So we tell parents, keep calm, that they're on their way. <laughs> That's right. Uh, again, the first few days, and again, you know, uh, if, if the child is at the bus stop five minutes prior to it, uh, and again, allow us a few minutes there if, you know, we're running a little bit late for, for one, whatever reason that may be. Great. Well, we just want to make the parents be calm and relaxed and know that if they're excited <laughs> and uh, that we're coming to get the kids. So how many bus drivers do we have this school year? Well, we have 238 contracted driver positions. Uh, so uh, we we pretty much uh, will use every one of them you know mm -hmm. throughout the day. And again, we only transport approximately 47 percent of all students in Norfolk. Right. So what type of training do our bus drivers have? Well, the bus drivers to be initial bus driver, of course, they undergo a, uh, a both classroom and behind the wheel training. Uh, classroom uh, involves 24 hours of classroom training, and then there's an additional 24 hours behind the wheel training that uh, that they undergo. Okay, and they receive a, what, a CDL license? Uh, yes, they'll receive a CDL license. And if I may put a plug in that uh, we always could use bus drivers. So, yes. so if uh, you know of someone out there that uh, might be interested in, uh, in being a bus driver, contact our office and we will um, uh, let them know what they need to do to, uh, to attend one of our training sessions. Well, let's do a quick PSA. Give us the phone number. Okay, the phone number that they can call us on is 892-3320. And also, too, our bus drivers, before they actually hit the first week of school, they've been practicing and going through those routes, correct? That's correct. Next week, they will actually go out uh, on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, they will review their routes and then uh, actually uh, go out and drive the routes, you know, to see if they may encounter any uh, congestion areas or, or, or perhaps a particular street is under construction or, or something of that mm -hmm. nature and they may have to take a detour. So uh, that will give them an opportunity next week to actually run their routes to look for those problem areas. Right. And you mentioned you transport 47 percent of the kids. How many miles and how much gas is that in a school year? Well, we, uh, we average a little over three million miles a year on the school buses in Norfolk. Uh, 
and I don't have at the top of my head what the amount of fuel is, but it's considerable. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of our budget. And not only do you transport to school, but you do athletics too. Uh, we do uh, everything involving transportation. We do the home to school, and of course the school to home. We do many of the after school programs, uh, as well as we do a lot of athletic and field trips. And, and uh, uh, Our buses are on the road uh, quite frequently beyond normal school operating hours. Mm -hmm. Great. So the, the, the wheel buses keep rolling. That they do. <laughs> Bus wheels keep rolling. Thank you, Bob, for coming on the show. And you've made some parents calm, especially me. So I look forward to this school year. And uh, thank you for sharing some information with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank great, great. And we want to thank you for tuning in to this special edition of Back to School. Um, on NPS Now. You can stay tuned to NPS Now on Channel 47 or you can view us online at www.mpsk12.com. If you have any great story ideas or information, you can email us at nps underscore news at mpsk12.com. Have a great school year and thank you for watching NPS Now.